right from the get go, we knew we don't want to be this kind of restaurant where there's shouting in the kitchen and the, the stuff Anthony Bourdain describes in his books. Like, yeah, and everyone's just swearing and everyone, there's pans flying around and everyone hates each other. So we said, we're not going to have that kind of atmosphere in our restaurant. That was a clip from today's guest, Mike Desta. Mike is a lifelong animal rights advocate, musician, and restaurateur. Without any industry experience or formal background, he entered the restaurant industry head on and figured it out along the way. Along with his business partner and fellow punk, Jonathan Sternberg, Mike runs two restaurants in Mannheim, Germany, Kambusa and Houseboot. This is an awesome conversation and we're really excited that Monica could join us as well too. So before we get into it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. I'm your host, Aram Arslanian, and this is One Step Beyond. Everyone, we're back. Uh, today, we are recording the podcast from beautiful Mannheim. Um, so we're out here on tour with Change, and we're also out here doing some podcasts for One Step Beyond. It has been an incredible trip. And one of the coolest things about being able to go on tour and see different places in the world is to also interact with like local economies and see all of the great you know, businesses and all things in the community that really make each place special. And today's guest is someone who is a part of a local economy and really I'd say it like a national economy, you know, because he's, he's uh, helping bring veganism into a different space within Germany. So with that, uh, I'm really excited to have you on the, on the podcast today. Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, Aram. Hi, Monica. Nice to meet you both too in uh, Mannheim. Uh, I'm Michael uh, Desta. Um, I live and born and raised in the Rhein-Neckar area. And um, nowadays I run two vegan restaurants in Mannheim and Ludwigshafen, and which are two twin cities um, just uh, separated by the Rhine River. And so, yeah, I run those two restaurants and also a little, uh, little other, other things going on, but uh, the main focus is on the restaurants. Um, how about you start at the beginning and just tell us about what your personal path to veganism looked like? So I think I stopped eating meat when I was like 15, maybe, um, because I was never the one to really enjoy meat. So I guess I've never had a steak in my life. I always call it like child's meat when it's like, like, uh, breaded schnitzel or like minced meat in a bolognese sauce or something like that. That's the stuff I ate. But I've never had like a big piece of chunk of meat. Um, my parents did though. So, but I was never, it was never my kind of taste. And then I stopped eating meat at 15 and I think it was like 18, 19, so 20, 22 years ago, I went full vegan um, just because, just because um, when, I think when you start getting into a vegetarian lifestyle, you somehow, at least in the early days of the internet, you get exposed when looking for recipes, you get exposed to animal rights. Mm -hmm. Some might call it propaganda. Others might call it information. Um, and then, so I just made up my mind that I just don't want to eat any more dairy or eggs and stop eating all along. Wow. So you also grew up in like the punk and hardcore scene and you play in a band that I love, uh, I think it's one of the best hardcore bands going today. And I don't just mean within Europe, I think globally, I think Spirit Crusher is just an incredible band. So coming up in hardcore, was it that you found veganism or vegetarianism or the ideas about animal rights? Was it through that or was there other factors involved? So I think for the vegetarianism and basically just not eating meat, it was, it was a natural development, but then being in a punk and hardcore scene, especially like a very political scene in the early 90s, mid 90s. And in Mannheim, it was really, really political. Um, that made the transition to going vegan 
fairly easy because like in the area we had one of the first vegan uh mail orders that shipped like vegan foods and um stuff like that so it was at least when it was hard to get tofu somewhere else we could get at least a little bit of of vegan foods around here so that helped a lot and that hardcore was definitely a big part of that uh of that kind of educational aspects of finding out through like bands at like earth crisis chokehold whatever to um yeah what what all this is about oh yeah and of course shout out to the great earth crisis who to whom we all a huge oh a huge debt of gratitude and shout out to chokehold my canadian brethren that's <laughs> cool that you said that um cool that's cool so you've been vegan for a long time and vegan back when it wasn't easy to be vegan. <laughs> Tell us how you made the leap from being an early stage vegan to cr- starting your own business, your own vegan restaurant. Well, I think the the first the first soy milk soy milk I ever drank, I thought, okay, I'm gonna skip this. This is not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was not. It was not fun. It was like nowadays. Uh, it is it is nice to go walk into any convenience store and even like discount supermarkets and get like good vegan products everywhere but then it was back then it was like okay so i could clearly understand why people would say i could never go vegan or never go vegetarian this tastes like crap and obviously like back then it did but now it's gotten way better um so starting the restaurant was I I have a degree in English uh, literature and sociology and media and communication science. And then after that, I uh, worked uh, a while for a TV production company as a pro, uh, uh, as an assistant and camera assistant. And then I did a short stint at Nintendo and worked in tech for like two, three years and really found out that corporate culture would at least that kind of corporate culture was not the thing I'm too comfortable with. And I think maybe everyone somehow has that dream in the back of their head of starting their own restaurant, club, a place where they could do whatever they want. And so after after the two years at Nintendo, I thought, okay, I'm 30 now. And if I don't, follow that dream right now I'm probably not going to do it and then things kind of fell in place because I met my business partner um, through mutual friends who's also a punk rock kid Um, and we had mutual friends and they said yeah if you want to do this restaurant thing and you have any questions about like how to set up a kitchen or how to develop a menu go ask John because he has done it before. And so we met, we talked, we figured out, or he figured out that he doesn't want to be like a chef working for someone else. And our ideas of how to set up a restaurant and what we wanted to do were kind of similar. And so we decided, Hey, let's do this together. And then um, it took us almost a year to find a location and get everything in order. And then after that year, we opened the first restaurant. That was almost, no, it was more than 10 years ago now. That's awesome. Um, So one of the things I love about your story is you didn't have any background in the restaurant industry yourself. I know your partner did, but but you literally came up through a different channel and there's this sense of like, oh, I'm just going to do this. I love when people don't ask permission or feel that they have to like, kind of like go through, they have to have some kind of traditional background in whatever they're doing. They're just going to decide to do it and figuring it out. Was there ever any moment where you felt like, oh shit, maybe I shouldn't do this. What the hell do I know? Or were you always just like, whatever, I'm taking the leap of faith. I mean, I was lucky that uh, like my family background was super supportive. Um, and my mom once joked, like when she saw me standing at the grill flipping burgers, she said, yeah, that's what I send you to school for. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but my, but my dad, uh, my dad always said he was, um, he was proud of having never worked for someone else in his life, but always for himself. He was an architect and 
said, yeah, I've never worked for someone else. And so he was super supportive. Um, and the, the real, there was never any doubt. It took kind of a long time to find a place and to get all like the, the business plan in order and stuff. So there were obviously days when we were like, oh, this sucks. We can't find any place and there was nothing. And, um, but then the, the first real enlightenment that I had was when we actually opened, then I realized I've never done this before. I've like, I've worked at a bar, like at shows, I've cooked at shows, I've worked at a bar and stuff like that. But I've never been into hospitality in a real professional way. And I thought like, okay, I have to serve people now. I have to like get their orders, get the orders in place, get them to the kitchen in time and stuff like that. And at one point I realized, good God thinks that I have not tried to do this alone, <laughs> but that I have someone back there in the kitchen who kind of at least knows how to run a restaurant. Um, so in the beginning, it was really helpful to have someone professional with me, but, um, I basically never doubted myself because I thought we both have like a, a good network of people and friends. And if we just can get our friends into the restaurant for the like first three to six months and show people, okay, there's people in the restaurant, we're going to do fine because there was nothing basically the the gastronomical landscape in Mannheim was asleep for like 20 years and mm -hmm. there was no cool new nice places to visit and then so we thought okay there's a niche that we could just go into and then should work out for us wow um, so you clearly fell um filled a niche so what were your big takeaways when you started your restaurant that informed your expansion because you have two restaurants now well, we never had a, we never had a like a five year, 10 year business plan. It was just like, we go along as we go. Um, and then basically we started the restaurant and in the first year, both of us were there literally all the time, like every day, five days a week from nine in the morning till 11 at night. Um, just because we we always thought we're just going to go with small steps. We don't want to hire too many people in the beginning and then have to let someone go or uh, have to like get money from the bank. But we always financed everything ourselves. Mm. Just because none of us either had a, like a background in any kind of business uh, dealings. So we we thought, okay, if we can just get this thing going, then something's going to happen. Then we took small steps, uh, hired the first couple of people um, and um, did some caterings at big festivals. So everything built, like built up on each, everything else. And then, um, yeah, after five, after let's say three years, we were in a situation where we could have a little more private life and could at least develop some new ideas. Okay. Is there anything we want to do next or are we going to stop right there? And then, um, after five years, we had the opportunity or we were given the opportunity more or less um, to open another restaurant because, uh, there is a cultural center in Ludwigshafen, like I said, when town Mannheim and Ludwigshafen, um, and they asked, Hey, uh, our caterer just left us. Could you imagine, doing caterings for our shows. And we go like, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, it's not going to be worth enough if we do it for four people. But if you have a bigger show with like 10, 15 people, we're happy to come in, either cook here or bring food. And then the, the former head of the, of the place, uh, said, yeah, we do have this old restaurant here in the same building. And I think, if the right people do it for the right reasons, it's going to work because it has, I went to school just across the street from that place and I've seen it open and closed again and then open and closed again with various like concepts. Someone just doing like 
Bratwurst or Currywurst. And then there was another one just making schnitzel. And then it was a Turkish place. So it was open and closed again. And he said, yeah, I think if the right people do it, it will work. And he said, yeah, I think you guys are the right people because you're in it for the right reasons. And then we talked and talked. And he said, so what do you think are the biggest obstacles? And we go like, the one obstacle that's always there is money. So and he said, yeah, let's try to figure something out. And the city gave it to us for free. So oh. at first we did not pay any rent. And he said, yeah, just try it out if it works. And uh, it works. If it doesn't, you might lose a couple euros or have invested a little time or a lot of time, actually. But um, yeah. And so for five years, this this has been the second restaurant. And over there, business is growing because right now, after the pandemic, all kinds of events are coming back. Caterings are coming back. And basically, that's what we make the money of because the daily lunch business just more or less covers our cost and then uh all kinds of events uh, we hope to make even a little more money oh yeah uh, that's an amazing story but let's go back to kind of like the soul of the of the restaurant like restaurants you know they have like their take or their approach so if you were to say for your restaurants what's your approach to veganism well for us it was always clear that we don't want to be too upfront because I think John's a vegetarian. I'm a vegan. Um, for us, it was always clear. We're not going to be like, cause I don't think you, we could sustain a business just with vegans coming in. Yeah. Like, I think I read when we, when we opened, it was like 2% of the population in Germany are vegan. It's grown like over the ten, last 10 years, it's probably grown to maybe 10%. And it was like 20, maybe 25% are vegetarians. So it was obviously clear in a city of 300,000 people that 1% would be like 3,000 people. And you, you cannot sustain a business, a restaurant business with like just 3,000 people. So we knew we had to be open, not to be too much upfront. We did have some. Um, there was like, we do have animal rights groups in the restaurant who, when we started, had like a monthly meeting and stuff like that. But it was never, for us, it was never too, too preachy or anything. So it was always like, hey, we try to make, we would call it healthy fast food. It's burgers, it's falafel, it's burritos. Um, but everything is made from scratch. Um, and so, yeah, this is basically the, the approach we always had. And for the, for the newer restaurant, the houseboat, it's like, okay, we want to give people the opportunity to have like a, a light kind of lunch, not just plain salad or everything, but something that allows them to go back to work and not fall into a food coma. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. That's cool. Um, Aram and I love traveling and trying vegan food all over the world. And our rating system is actually based on <laughs> the years that veganism has really been a thing. Um, so sometimes we'll try something at a restaurant and it's, you know, this is 1995 vegan okay. or meh, this one is 2000 vegan. Um, we actually went to McDonald's yesterday and got a, their vegan burger for the first time. And what would you say? It was like a 2000 vegan? Yeah, I'd say 2000. <laughs> two, it was, two, it was meh. It's, it's around probably 2000. pure McDonald's, right? I've it, not tried it. it. It was, yeah, pure McDonald's is a good way to describe it. It was not good. It, it wasn't good. It was like, it was like, I'm not going to be polite here. Like, I don't want to eat at McDonald's at all. No. And we were, whatever, I'm not going to make an excuse. So we ended up at McDonald's on the highway. We're touring. And I was like, all right, I'll talk into this. And actually, it was Mike who said, um, micro producer it was like, Hey, like kind of beyond burger has become the, the kind of like the foundational burger at yeah. this point. And everyone just thinks, so it's like, it was like a beyond burger, but like with all of the pepper in the world has put in, put yeah. in this thing, okay. not and sauce on top of it. Not good. Yeah. Not great. But what's great is that we can get vegan food everywhere and we're curious to try it. So yeah. what's your take on the vegan fast food movement? Well, 
it's like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I mean, it's it's great that it's readily available everywhere and to some kind of degree in a like tasty way. Maybe not the McDonald's burger, but all like basically all major fast food chains, at least in Germany and probably in the US and Canada as well, now offer vegan alternatives, which is on the one hand good and but on the other hand as a as running a vegan business i don't think it it takes any business away from us um but i've heard from like especially smaller companies that produce like vegan convenience food that it is a problem that major players as nestle or uh unilever come into the market and take like not just a tiny share of their business but a big share of their mm-hmm. business. So all the pioneers, pioneering companies that were there from the start now do face like competition of multinational corporations where they just cannot compete in any kind of way, like financially and or distribution wise. Right. So it is good that veganism is becoming more and more mainstream, that it's more and more readily available, that people are like eager to try it because advertisement looks nicer than it used to look. It's not just in health food stores and like, uh, but so I think, yeah, it's good in some way uh, for, and f- as a businessman or like just on f- from business perspective, for us, it's good that because everyone now sees okay this stuff tastes kind of good so i might as well try out a vegan restaurant Mm -hmm. um there's a lot of nuances here and this goes back to a conversation that uh chris from uh sect uh, and i had in kind of like the early days of the podcast we were talking about like as vegans we all you know, back in the day, he said it so perfectly. He's like, oh man, when I was like young and I got into veganism, it was horrendous. The food was terrible. Like I, w- I always think of this dude. I remember we were playing a show in Edmonton and it's the first time I ever saw someone drink soy milk. And this homie was like, had this like big, cause you know, it came in big containers. It wasn't like little containers, it had a big container. It was hot. I don't know why he had soy milk <laughs> and he was taking sips of it and you could see him wincing. And I yeah. was like, that looks horrible. It's like, no, no, it's good. <laughs> it's not. It was just like water with like a soy taste with like, <laughs> yeah. So um, what Chris had been saying was basically like, Hey, when we were young and we all wanted options, this was kind of the goal was like, you could go anywhere, you could get anything. But then once big business comes in, big business doesn't care about the ethics of it. They don't care about these things. They just care about money and they don't care about the meat eaters money or the vegetarians money or the vegans money. They care about all of the money. They just want an oligarchy. So whenever I think about this, cause I also don't want to be like, Oh, like big business. That sucks. Like that to me is limited thinking. Cause we live in a world where that's going to happen. Yeah. So how do you interact with things? And it, it's a real dilemma. Like, um, I love that because big businesses have been, have been involved it can help a restaurant like yours. And I, I believe many other uh, people who are like restauranters who, um, restaurateurs, Centurers. <laughs> who have, uh, have started places because there is so much more attention and knowledge, awareness, at least sure. the common person is more interested in being like, oh, I tried vegan food at my friend's house. It was good. Maybe I'll go to this restaurant. I love that. I love that it gets people curious about the diet, turns people onto the idea of the possibilities. I love that. What I hate and drives me totally crazy are these people who did it from this totally ethical place. And they were the people like, like you'd said, the first uh, vegan mail order. Yeah. You know, like the people who are in it, who made all of us, who made our lifestyles possible, them getting pushed out of the market. What do we do as adults who can choose how we spend our money and as people who understand business? Are there things that we can do? to kind of make the the best out of the situation where we can still honor the people who initiated in the small businesses while also just enjoying kind of having more options. Yeah. I mean, there's like with all consumption, there's always like 
possibilities to there might be there's probably never going to be the perfect solution but there's a close second and then there's something which is the worst possible solution for example in germany one of the biggest meat producers um who got into producing vegetarian sausages and stuff like that pretty early on now made more revenue from vegetarian products or vegan products than from their meat products. So, um, and still, I know a lot of people who say, I'm not going to buy their product because they're still a meat producing company. Mm. And so I personally don't buy their products, but if like my, my partner's, parents for example buy it because they they know the company they it says vegan on the on the label they know what to buy i'll for sure eat it at breakfast yeah. and whatever so i think you should or like at least if we have the capacity to spend our money wisely we should try and yeah, like I said, there's not going to be the perfect solution and there's not going to be a perfect life. But every I think every small little contribution helps reducing suffering for animals. So if if you if if a company that used to produce like only meat products now produce half of their half of their uh, stuff is is vegan good for basically everyone they make money animals don't suffer it's more readily available for the consumer so why not yeah and i think as i think i've read an interview because it's somehow uh the the son of the founder is i don't know vegan or vegetarian so he was the one getting the company on track to go vegetarian and I think his plan is to make it a full vegetarian company. So if that happens, great. It's like a, a mafia family going legit and like moving out of being criminals. Maybe, into, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe I watched too much Godfather. <laughs> um, I feel like we all love animals. Um, we inherently love all animals, including farmed animals. And we're all compassionate people to some degree, especially children. But most of us are raised eating meat. Um, how do we stop the cognitive dissonance? And what would you advise people who are curious about veganism and love animals, but just don't know where to start? Well, the, the, what we always do in the restaurant, if, if a family comes in and Usually it happens on the weekends. And sometimes if there's a newspaper article on like, say, Thursday, we can tell that on Saturday there's going to be families waiting outside in front of the restaurant uh, before we open. And you can clearly see that at least most of the time, I mean, it's a stereotype, but most of the time it's the father who's like skeptical. It's like, okay where has my daughter taken me and where is this place? And then obviously make some kind of joke. Yeah. Can I get the grilled chicken, whatever? And we always go like, Hey, you're going to find something on our menu, something that might be familiar to you, but there's also stuff that you might've never heard of. And, and then we just give them advice, try this or try that. And we always go like, Hey, if you want to try it and if you don't like it, you don't have to pay if you like it great for everyone. So trying it is like just the first, just be open-minded and try it. And then there's so much information out there. And also there's real good guides for not only restaurants, but also products. And even because I know that a lot of people are skeptical of about raising your child uh, in a vegetarian and oh, not not even vegan way, but people like, yeah, is it going to grow up? Is it going to be strong enough? What about calcium? What about the bones? There's so many guides and information. And even like a lot of doctors say that it is beneficial for brain development, muscle development, whatever. So you don't even have to dig that deep, but just dig a little. And um, yeah, so, and I think even... 
for like daycare or schools and cantinas in school now, hopefully start to offer more and more vegetarian and vegan options. So I think the, the education starts just with the taste and then you could go from there and then see, let people try, uh, maybe in the best possible way they find their own information because that is what mostly sticks. But, um, cause if a teacher tells you, yeah, do this as a teenager, you're probably going to be like, no, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's, I want to pop into a leadership question. So how, how big is your staff? Um, with the two restaurants, it's about 20 people. Okay. Um, prior to, um, having your first employees at the restaurant, had you ever been a boss of anyone before? Um, when I, when I worked at Nintendo, I was a team leader for, uh, a short time. Like it was, it was in the Q and a department. Um, and, um, we had like teams, we were like, the whole team was like 60 people. And then there was supervisors and then team leaders and the team leaders, because Nintendo offered so many different products and all had to get tested. Um, I had like, it was like, uh, I was, uh, we were all kind of equal, but then there was like someone who had to check the test reports and, but I have no, uh, no prior experience of leading a team. It was just like, okay. I'm the one reading, proofreading the reports that you guys write. So that makes me team lead, but yeah. So you had some, what I call kind of like frontline leadership experience. A little, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what has been for you the biggest challenge about being a leader? Like what's something that you've had to actively work on in being a leader? Well, at first it was like, when we first had to hire staff, it was like, okay, we are not prepared for this. It's like, luckily it was more or less friends that we knew and we, we worked on a quite friendly basis, which we still do because from right from the get go, we knew we don't want to be this kind of restaurant where there's shouting in the kitchen. And it's like, what does the stuff Anthony Bourdain describes in his books? Like, yeah. And everyone's just swearing and everyone there's pans flying around and everyone hates each other. So we said, we're not going to have that kind of atmosphere in our restaurant. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to try to make it as chill as possible. Um, and then that might've been for me personally, the biggest challenge that yes, we are all friends or on a friendly basis, but somehow I have to make sure that it gets whenever I tell you something, I need it to be done. And it's not like, yeah, I'm going to do it tomorrow. No, if I need it to be done today, you got to do it today. And just because maybe of my, of my own character, this is still to this day kind of hard for me. If someone asks me if he can take a day off and I know there's a catering going on, I go like, yeah, we'll figure something out instead of just saying, no, I need you that day. So, um, because John is, uh, is a little different in that department. He's like, he's the stricter guy. So we kind of have a good relation of playing like good cop, bad cop. Whenever staff comes to me, he's like, Mike, I need this. And I go like, yeah, you gotta ask John. And he goes like, <laughs> no, you can't have that. So, um, uh, yeah, that is a, a good working relationship for us. And, um, so I think we, we figured out a good way to communicate with our team uh, while still remaining like on a super friendly basis and nice working environment. Um, I would go so far as to say that you're also a leader in your community. Can you tell us a bit about what you do in the community and what you're planning to do in the next couple of years? So, uh, right from the start, we knew because the, the area, the, our first restaurant, the Kumbuzi is in, um, is like the typical, nowadays gentrified neighborhood so it was like a lot of immigrants living in the area because it was the old um back in the 60s it was a red light district and port uh port and harbor area nowadays um 
the city decided like 15 years ago to build a university for popular music just around the corner. And that has been like the starting point of the typical gentrification process. Got rents going up, people get evicted and stuff like that. So for us, it was always clear that we're not just going to be in the community and take but also give back and be part of the community. So we sponsored like a kids soccer team. Um, there's, there was, it, it fell apart because of COVID in the last two, three years, but there was always this, um, uh, this run, like an hour long run just around the, the neighborhood. And the more rounds people ran, the more uh, we donated uh, to like, child educational programs and stuff like that. So all our staff, we would run. Uh, and it was like, yeah, I, I'm not good at running, but it's like, yeah, just take a walk. You just walk around the block for an hour. And then, uh, so we did that. Um, we have uh, cooking courses for kids, uh, underprivileged kids um, at some place. So we always try, because there's other players like, there's a theater company around the corner and they have events. And then we try to help out them with um, if they need any like material or if they need like food and then we just donate food for them. Um, and so, yeah, we try to stay as open as possible and um, for everyone to come in. And um, yeah, we also um, like if, if the kids from the neighborhood need to do an internship for school. Um, we try to give them the opportunity. Um, yeah, so this is, we try not, I mean, there's always more that could be done, but we try to be a part of the community and not just take, take whatever the community, like basically we are in a lucky position that since we've been there for like 10 years now, we still have a really good, uh, lease contract don't pay too much rent compared to everyone that just comes now so um we are in a comfortable position just to be like a part of the community you mentioned earlier uh, you said at the beginning of our conversation when you'd worked in corporate culture you didn't like you didn't like the culture it just didn't work for you and you've talked a lot about the culture that you have at the restaurant and at the two restaurants culture is a a thing that people talk about a lot in the most vague terms. So like there's this saying that I hear in the business world, I hear it less now, but it always makes me cringe when they say oh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I always see leaders say things like this, like as if they've said like, <laughs> <clears throat> like the most philosophical thing. <laughs> I've also seen companies that like talk about a lot about culture. It's like, well, when your qu quarterly results are down, nobody's talking about culture. People are talking about results and like yeah. driving, you know, bottom line. Um, so culture though, is it's so interesting and so important because it has so much to do with like quality of life for people who work there, living up to your values, mental health concerns for people who work within an organization. It's about getting good results, but in, in a healthy and proper way. And at the end of the day for small businesses, culture is like a maker or breaker. But what's interesting is you could have a good culture and your business could totally fail because it's not, you could have a nice culture, but it's not a good culture because people don't do the things that you ask them to do mm -hmm. and everyone's like, you know, whatever, or you could have a culture that's not nice and your business does great, but nobody wants to work there. So going beyond the kind of like, Oh yeah, we just strive to have a good culture. What do you specifically do to have a good culture? And I know this is a very tough question, uh, but I'm, I'm really passionate about strong, healthy company cultures. And I want to always, I always want to get the thinking of like, what are the practical real things that you do as a small business owner? So I think listening is very important. Like listening, like to your employees, listening to your guests and you don't have to do anything or everything that guests ask you. It's like, if we had done that, we would have like a 10 page menu and <laughs> uh, have like the most outrageous drinks. Like you should try, there's this great lemongrass 
whatever lemonade from imported from Puerto Rico that you need to try. It's the best. Yeah, well, no, uh, because we're going to have it in uh, in the fridge for forever. So but basically, like, try to get feedback from our employees. Um, and like I said, we have this kind of good cop, bad cop. John is not a bad cop. It's just not. I'm sorry, you're doing, you're doing I'm sorry buddy. Dirty. You're not a bad cop. No, no, no. no. Poor John. Um, <laughs> and I'm not always the good cop. So, um, but um, with like having two two people at the at the top, it's like if if employees don't feel comfortable talking to one, they can always talk to it the other one. Mm. And I always tell our employees, like maybe if you need. To, to take a day of sick leave or if your kid at home is sick and you're uh, uh, a single mom or a single dad, you can just talk to us and it's not a big deal. And if you're sick for like a longer time, that's not your problem. This is our problem. It's like, we have to take, we have to provide the circumstances that make working for you as comfortable as possible. So that starts from like, yeah, in the kitchen, we need sharp knives. So we sharpen the knives. We need like aprons. So we wash the aprons. You don't have to bring your own clothes or if you want, you can bring your own clothes, but there is clothes available for you. If you like, like I said, if you need a day off, we will find a replacement. And then if we don't have a replacement, uh, it's going to be, uh, us working so not your problem and i think getting the feedback getting uh people the opportunity to talk to you on a like on an even level helps a lot so how has your experience through covid impacted how you lead your team well i think for everyone it was hard during covid like uh, restaurants closing, just uh, only doing takeaway or delivery. And so for us, it was hard to find a balance of, we didn't want to let anyone go because we knew that after the pandemic is semi over, we are going to need staff and it's going to be hard to find good people that already know our restaurant. So we tried to give at least uh, a couple of hours to everyone, like especially our like full-time staff. Obviously they got the most hours. And then if it was just part-time or like a mini jobbers, uh, we tried to give them at least some hours, either delivering stuff by bike or um, working at the window, handing out food. Um, and it kind of worked out pretty good for us. So I don't think, I mean, some people left because they either moved or started to go to university somewhere, but um, now we are in an okay position just as everything is opening up again and business starts striving again, that we can, can handle all, all requirements that we have. All right. So we're heading towards the end of the podcast. I'm going to ask one question. Monica, ask another, and then we're going to go into the three toughest questions that we're going to ask you in the entire interview. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with the first one and it is a personal one. And if you want, we can totally, uh, you can, we can say no to the question. Um, so we were talking this morning, we were having coffee this morning. You mentioned that you lost both your parents at, uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, but they were there to be able to see your businesses go up and, you know, grow and thrive and, and start. Um, you know, we're older now. We're at a place where people have kids, people are starting to lose their parents. Life is starting to change. Um, did the loss of your parents impact any of the way that you run your business or live your life? For sure. I mean, mm, they were always kind of, I mean, your parents always stay, you always stay the kid of your parents. Yeah. You're never an adult when you're with your parents. Yeah. So even 
like the the craziest questions sometimes they know the answers or at least know someone that knows an answer or has an idea and my dad was an architect and just never worked for someone else but for himself and so when whenever we had like kind of a business question he goes like yeah just try this or call that guy and yeah this is the number of my accountant so now I'll have to figure out everything by myself. Um, it took me like almost two years now with all the inherit everything that I inherited, like I inherited their house and stuff like that. So it took me two years to get everything in order there because I thought, okay, one day I'm going to cancel the, the phone contract and that's it for the day because I don't want to rush things. I don't want to, uh overwork myself with all that workload because there's also there it's part of the the grievance process and i did this and then the next day i sold the car and then a week later i sold my mom's book collection and stuff like that so small steps and for the business always it was like yeah they came around and were at the restaurant like they they came every monday just to have breakfast or brought cake. And so we saw each other like once a week and um, it was strange. It was strange now that even like relatives that used to come with them, like my aunt or my uncle uh, came and I don't see them that often anymore. I mean, we were never a super tightly close knit family, but then again, it was always fun to see them on my, on Mondays. And nowadays it's like, I see them twice a year instead of once a week. Um, and for business, it was, uh, it didn't change too much. I think for us in the business aspect, because since it's been running for 10 years, everything should be on like a solid foundation to run on its own. Um, yeah, it's more on a personal level that that it has somehow affected me. And I could, the good thing, that was the only, basically, I, I always say that was the only thing, the only good thing about COVID was that I got to stay with my mom uh, for the last two months of her life because of the restaurant being closed due to COVID. Yeah. So my, my dad lives with uh, dementia and during um, the pandemic, we had to, it became so advanced that we had to move them uh, into a home. And one of the things is like a business owner, you know, like I, when I first started the business or any of like, kind of like my professional stuff, I'd always like kind of look over the shoulder and have my dad being like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, and now I don't really have that anymore. Yeah. And like, I got to do that for myself and, and more so I have, I, you know, I can, I can look to my side and have Monica. Being yeah. like, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, I literally right, have a right yeah. beside me. Um, that's why I, I ask business owners that because, you know, sometimes people have stories. It's like, well, I wasn't close with my parents, so it didn't factor in. And other times, like, I, I love what you said. It's like, uh, like, you know, you're always your kid when you're with your parents. And now you're like an adult in the world and you don't have, who do you go to for these answers? Right. Yeah. Like when things like, I feel that like profoundly with, with my dad where I'm like, my dad wouldn't necessarily have an answer. He'd usually have some kind of like very harsh Armenian thing to say to me. And I'd be like, oh, but like, I always could look over my shoulder and have him being like, hell yeah, you're doing yeah. this thing. It was, it was, I found a, when I was clearing their, out their, their stuff, I found a journal that my dad kind of kept. Um, and, or at least like in his daily calendar. And then he noted some things. Yeah. I went to my son's restaurant. It was, and he literally, he literally wrote, went to my son's restaurant, not went to Michael's place or so it was great and stuff like that. So that was kind of a nice, a nice thing to see. I mean, I always knew that they were proud of me and of what we were doing and the way we were doing it. But then just like I said, we were not super tight and super close, but also we had a super good relationship. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was nice to see that when we, we got award, uh, awarded an, an award for like 
because in the in the restaurant in one of the restaurants we employ people with disabilities and we got awarded uh this prize for like uh that we are just a good employer for people with disabilities and got this grant like this plaque and whatever and so yeah my dad cut out like uh, newspaper articles and had it stashed at home and stuff like that. So that was really nice to see. I have a food question. Yeah. Yes. So you catered the food for the tour last night. It was delicious. The most delicious meal we've had. Yet. Really good. Yeah. What's your favorite dish on your menu? Well, like in the, in the houseboat, we usually do like, we have a daily uh, lunch special and, not only me, but most of the customers go for the daily lunch special because it's something different every day. It could be a curry, curry. It could be like a schnitzel. It could be a burrito. It could be basically anything that we we come up with. Um, so I'll go for that. And at the Kombuse, we we switch up the menu a little because, like, after I think five years, we we started adding new stuff, taking out stuff that. We thought, okay, for example, we we have uh, this falafel plate, and now there's two really good falafel places just around the corner, run by people from Syria. So we thought, okay, hey, they do it so much better than we do. Um, let's think about switching it up. And then we, instead of falafel, we made like uh, a quinoa uh, spinach balls. So, and then we try to switch it up. And nowadays uh, we have like three bowls, like with lentils and sweet potatoes and like this one with the oyster mushrooms and stuff. So usually I'd go for one of those bowls. Delish. That sounds really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really good. All right. Um, we're going into the three hard questions. All right. The first one is going to be, easy and we haven't touched on it so I, i'm only going to ask you really two hard okay. questions so we haven't really totally got into it and we'll get into it a bit in your bio like when i do the intro but just with your own uh from your own perspective tell us about the two restaurants like give us their names and just like about each one what makes them unique okay so the first restaurant is called kombuse which uh is the german word for the the kitchen on a ship mm -hmm. Um, just because we are in the port area. So um, it is, I would call it uh, like it's fast food, but it's healthy fast food. So we do a black bean burger. We do, like I said, the, the quinoa, quinoa uh, spinach balls and stuff like that. So it's kind of healthy fast food. We don't have a, a fryer, so we don't fry anything. Um, everything is made from scratch. And, um, we are like, it's affordable. It's like when we started, uh, the burger would go for like four euros. Now it's getting like with inflation and everything and like being there for 10 years, obviously, but still, uh, another restaurant here always said to us, um, he wants his customers to enjoy a meal drink a beer or any kind of drink and invite someone else to a beer for under 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, that was our goal as well. We thought, okay, we could, we could do that. It's like if we have a four or five euro burger and then a two, three euro drink. And um, nowadays it's a little more expensive, but still kind of affordable. So everyone could not only just come once a week or but maybe two or three times a week and people do. And in the second restaurant, it was always clear that with the lunch, uh, with the lunch, we could, we basically cover our costs. And then we are a little more focused on doing out, uh, outer house stuff, doing events, doing caterings. Um, but it's also, it's a little less fast foody. Um, but a little more whatever we feel like food because we have a smaller menu, which also includes like tacos and um, sandwiches, like Italian focaccia sandwiches. Um, yeah. 
So, and we are the only, in Ludwigshafen at least, we're for sure the only vegan restaurant and most likely the only vegetarian as well. Oh, sorry, what was the name of the second restaurant? Uh, Houseboat. Houseboat. Yeah, because uh, the the cultural center we're in is called Das Haus. Um, and then as we were trying to come up with a name, we thought, okay, with the house and the ship theme, article theme, it's going to be the houseboat, which had some people walking up to the river and looking for us. <laughs> and we're in, like, we're in the middle of the city center. <laughs> like, it's not too far from the river, but still, it's like, there's concrete. There's no water. There's just concrete around us. Um, Good to know. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's, yeah, it's called houseboat. Okay. Second question for you. Very hard. Yes, you've been vegan for a long time. Well, we're all dedicated vegans here. What's the one thing that you enjoyed before being a vegan that vegan cuisine just hasn't quite gotten yet? There just isn't that that flavor to it. What's that one thing? Mm, I mean. Obviously, there's been uh, basically, I think what most people would say is like cheese, um, because I mean, humans have made cheese for like, I don't know, 3000 years, maybe even longer. And they've just started making vegan cheese 30 years ago. So a lot of things have happened in those 30 years. And um, there's all nowadays, there's all kind of good cheeses. Um, yeah, so cheese might be one, and it probably sounds a little disgusting, but my grandma used to make those, it's called Leberknödel in German, which would be liver dumplings. And I think that was the last thing I, I ate before I stopped eating meat. And I would never, ever think about eating liver, like... If someone put like, I know it's a deli del delicacy that like a, a liver, but I would never, ever think of eating that. But the liver dumplings my grandma made, they were like super good. And I don't think you could recreate that taste. I'm, I'm excited because our, our head chef, uh, she, uh, she left uh, the restaurant. Uh, April, I think, because they're opening their own restaurant and it's going to be like, uh, like classical German dishes. And I'm probably, she's going to try to make liver balls as well. So we'll see. Okay. Last question. It's very hard. This is going to be a curveball because we've talked mostly about your business, yeah. but I got to ask it. You are a truly, uh, you're in hardcore. You've been a part of hardcore for a long time. And you play, as I said, in, I think one of the best bands uh, going in general. Historically, from your perspective, what are the three most important German hardcore bands? German? Oh, that's that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I warned you. Um, so I guess for for most kids, kids my age of like forty two kids um it's probably rikers um just because they were in the early 90s or in the 90s they were the biggest german band and every they were everywhere touring everywhere lost and found the label that uh released their records uh nowadays people know that they have a huge track record of just bootlegging and not paying their artists um but back then it was just like, yeah, this is a mail order. They carry all the stuff that people like. So it might be Rikers. Mm. And then there is, well, German. Hey. True Blue. Yeah. Like when I, I've never, I've never listened to True Blue when I was a kid. Um, but now with the research, they have this big resurgence and everyone's like, okay, this, they, they did something that no one else did around that time. Um, and maybe I would have to go sperm birds. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I also love, cause we've got people from all different backgrounds that listen to the podcast. Like some are from punk and hardcore. Some are like artists, political activists. And there's a lot of just like corporate people. And I love that corporate people who have no background in punk just found out there was a band called the sperm birds. Yeah. That's sick. <laughs> That's awesome. My God rides a skateboard. <laughs> all right. So as we're wrapping it up, Monica, do you have any last questions you want to ask Mike? No last questions for me. It's okay. it a great conversation. Awesome. Uh, Mike, anything that you want to hype up, you want to mention that you want to bring attention to before we're closing off? Um, no, <laughs> there's, there's basically nothing. Uh, I think it was great, uh, talking to you. It was, it was a real fun conversation. Uh, there's, uh, I hope that, uh, Germany is opening up, uh, and stays open in the next couple of months. Uh, I hope everyone stays healthy, stays safe. And so that we get to enjoy uh, more shows, more tours, uh, finally bands coming back over to Europe again, um, which did not happen. So I'm looking forward to that. Heck yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for being on the show. You're someone that I want to have on for a long time. You're also a wild drummer. So for anyone who gets thank a chance you. to see Spirit Crusher, please check out Mike. He is a great drummer. They're a great band. And please support his two restaurants and support veganism in general. Uh, everyone will see you in the outro. And Mike, drop the beat. That was an awesome conversation and it was so cool that we could do it in Mannheim with Mike and really just spend time together hanging out. It was just like a beautiful city and I've got to say Mike is just such a warm and authentic person. I got a ton out of the conversation. One of the things that I think is so important about this is like if you think about the restaurant industry it just seems like oh you've got it you've got to have a ton of experience to be able to do that and you totally don't. It's like with most things you can just decide to do something. You just got to make sure you do it well. Doing well is just a matter of your willingness to figure it out along the way, get feedback, learn from others. But taking the leap and having the courage to say, I'm going to you know, try my hand at that and I'm just going to do it. That's the key. I guess the other thing I'd add in is like, know when you're not able to do it and pull it off. So I want to go to my, my man, Matt from the hard times, you know, learn how to fail fast if it's not going to work out. The key here, again, is give it a shot. You know, things happen because people ha are willing to make it happen. And Mike and his business partner are such a great example of that. So if you are in the Mannheim area, please check out their two restaurants. And everyone out there, just give them some love on social media and check them out. All right. Until next time, I'm your host, Aram Marslanian, and this is One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond.